Okay. Today we're going to start uh, vibrations of bars, and uh, this is important for for a number of reasons. By vibrations, we mean you know this is a bar. And it can vibrate in different ways. I think we've talked about this before. There can be longitudinal vibrations. These are vibrations. When we say longitudinal, we mean in, in the same direction as the medium. There can be transverse vibrations. And then there's the, remember the torsional wave? Yeah, there's torsional too. We're going to do the first two. We won't, we won't um, I won't be lecturing on torsional vibrations, but you will be, you'll observe them in the fourth experiment. Um, and they satisfy the wave equation. It's in a short section in KFCS. So uh, why are they important? Well, um, these, the longitudinal motion in a bar is very similar to sound. So that's, that's one reason right there why we do bars. Uh, bars are actually utilized in underwater sources of sound. It's not uncommon to have, to have bars in, in a, a projector that sends out sound. Uh, there's another reason I should have down here is that this transverse motion, which we call flexure in the case of bars, I think I've told you this before, it does not satisfy the wave equation. It's not even close. Okay, it's fundamentally different. And it's just important in the study of acoustics to deal with some kind of waves that don't satisfy the wave equation. These are called dispersive waves. I think we talked a little bit about that before. We'll talk more about it when we get into it, the second half of this chapter. It's just very important to see an example of waves that don't satisfy the wave equation. For one reason, even if you're just interested in acoustics and we say, well, the wave equation you know, describes acoustics. Well, that's not completely true. It depends what, uh, how carefully you're modeling things. So dispersive effects can be introduced, effects that break the standard wave equation. So it's really, it's just necessary to have some familiarity with um, dispersive waves. And we're going to get that with a flexural motion. But for half of the chapter, we're going to deal with uh, the longitudinal waves. And here's a demonstration. This is a, um, maybe I should turn up the light. This is just an a aluminum rod, um, six feet by, I don't know, what is that, a half an inch or three, three eighths? I don't know, maybe a half an inch, roughly a half an inch. And it's been uh, scribed here. Okay, you can see that. It's been actually, uh, you know, turn on a lathe here. Those are particular marks that I'll explain. The, the first one here is right in the center. So if I support this in the center and I exert this frictional force on this, can you hear that? It's kind of hard to hear it. So, you know what this is? Rosin. Rosin, right. So baseball pitchers, violin, family. So I put some rosin on here, my fingers. What do you think the Q is here? High, right? I don't know what it is, but easily thousands. Loud, right? And all the sound is coming from the end here. All of the sounds coming from this end. This is pretty loud. Um, we'll come back and towards the end of the lecture, we'll do another demonstration with this. What's, sir, what's the physics behind the resin? Oh, it's loudness? it's called it's called um, stick slip. So this is how a violin bow works. It's a common way of exciting oscillations. As I, I'm, I'm, I'm there's a lot of friction here, and as I do this, there's a continual slipping and sticking. It's not just nice and smooth, but on a small scale there's this slipping and sticking. And what happens is it, I can put energy into the system. It, kind of, it locks onto a mode. There's positive feedback in, um, in, a, in the fundamental mode here and energy goes in. So it's, yeah, it's not real simple. <laughs> but that's the, basically the idea. And um, 
What's important about it is, if I just exerted a constant force, if there was just a constant force being exerted on this, how can that support oscillations? There's no way it can support oscillations, right? The wind coming off Puget Sound, exciting oscillations in the Tacoma, original Tacoma Narrows Bridge. There's no way that just a steady force can drive oscillations. So there, it was a different mechanism. It was vortex shedding. The, uh, the flow came, came here. Vortices were shed and they would kick. The, they would be, they'd be created at the front side, this side of the bridge. They'd be created and go, travel along the width of the bridge and then give a little kick at the other side. And that locked into this, this mode. And everyone's seen the video, right? Has everyone seen the video of Tacoma Narrows Bridge? Evangelos? Okay. <laughs> yeah, you got it. You got to see it. It's remarkable. So that's another example of the so-called maintained oscillator. And, that's, and a similar thing is happening here. You know, it looks like I'm just exerting this constant force. It's not really. It's continually slipping and sticking, and somehow that locks on and puts energy into this mode. It's almost always difficult to explain maintained oscillators. Okay. Oh, uh, somebody get the lights, please. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so there are, for these longitudinal vibration, vibrations, there are two cases, two uh, simple cases. And it depends upon the wavelength compared to the diameter. When the wavelength is long compared to the diameter, what you see here, you've got this bar, you've got this long wavelength, right, compared to the diameter. There are compressions and expansions, right? When it compresses, what's going to happen this way? It's expand. It's going to bulge or expand, right? When it stretches this way, what's going to happen? It's going to contract. So this is the case we're going to do. It's a common case. Uh, there's an elastic modulus that describes the strength of what's going on here. It's called Young's modulus. And if, you don't, if you've heard of it before, great. That's why I'm mentioning it. But if you haven't, no problem. We're going to introduce it later. There's another limiting case, though. When the wavelength is very small compared to the diameter. So now here we would have a really <coughs> tiny wavelength, very tiny wavelength here. Now what the wave sees is, because the wavelength is so small, it's essentially an infinite medium. And when you have a wave, an elastic wave, passing through an infinite medium, can it bulge? No, it can't bulge or contract. Because if you imagine this, just take this to be your axis here, and, and you imagine some bulging here. It's going to bulge here. It's going to have to bulge proportionally all along here, right? It's going to look like this. You would have huge amount of, the farther you get from the axis, the more motion you would have. It would look actually like this. Where's the axis? Right here, okay? So it would go like this, bulging and contracting, bulging and contracting. It can't move all that mass like that. So those waves are purely uh, unilateral. And the modulus that describes that is called the modulus of unilateral extension and compression. Anybody heard of that before? Anybody? Theory of elasticity? Hmm, okay. Well, it doesn't matter. We're going to introduce it. Now, it's the reason I talked about these moduluses here before actually introducing them is that the theory in this case is essentially the same as the theory in this case. All you have to do is use a different modulus. By the way, what do you think is, what's bigger? What's stiffer? When I have something and I'm compressing and expanding and it's bulging, as opposed to when it doesn't bulge, which, which is stiffer? It doesn't bulge. The one that doesn't bulge, yeah. So when you press on something and it bulges, you know, it's going to be the, the, the restoring force, it's the, you know, the spring constant. You can think of a hook, there's a Hooke's law here. The, the spring constant is less. Uh, okay. So we're going to work on this, and again, you can just, uh, the, uh, the other limiting case just carries over. You just got to switch, instead of the Young's modulus, use the modulus, the unilateral modulus here. Um, if you're in between these two cases, you're out of luck. It's more complicated. I've never, to be honest, I've never seen a treatment of that, but I'm sure it's in the literature. Okay, so where we begin here, and this is what we're doing, make no mistake about it, we're doing the theory of elasticity here, right? And we're doing it just enough of it to establish waves. We're not going to do the whole theory of elasticity. That's a whole course in itself. So no one's ever taken a course in elasticity? Okay, no mechanical engineers in here? Come on. 
No? <laughs> okay. Uh, all right, so here's the idea. We're going to deal with this quantity. And this is kind of universal here. because We use C as a displacement. So here's the idea. X will locate a point on the bar in equilibrium. So take this x value, x runs this way, take this x value here, and when the bar is in equilibrium, that's a point in the bar there. In general, that point, the bar is going to stretch and compress, so at any time, that point can be displaced from equilibrium. That displacement we call C, and it's going to be a function of x, the original, the equilibrium location, and a function of time. All right. Um, incidentally, I'll mention this briefly, and then I'll mention it again next quarter. We're letting x denote a point on the bar, okay, in equilibrium. This is called uh, a Lagrangian description. And the reason it has a name is, it's not the only way description that you can use to, to describe a continuum. In fluids, we use an Eulerian description. There, x is just... Um, the space, spatial coordinate in the laboratory frame. And that's what we're going to use next quarter to do sound. We'll use an Eulerian description. So there's a little bit of a distinction here. I'm just mentioning it. Um, that's all. Okay, so we're going to, you know what we're going to do. We're going to do Newton's second law on this. So we consider a little element of mass that run, that's in equilibrium. It runs from x to x plus dx. So we're thinking of this as a delta x, and of course, in the end, we're going to let, delta, let it go to zero. So that's why we're denoting it as a differential here. And we're going to, we need to look at the forces on that. The force on this element will be the, its mass times its acceleration. And that's going to give us our wave equation. Um, Okay, so at any time during the motion, in equilibrium, here's our element. Okay, it runs from x to x plus dx. At any time during the motion, that <coughs> element will be, there'll be some displacement. The left end will be displaced by some amount c. The right end will be displaced by c plus a different, you know, it's, it's going to be different and because it's a different x. It's x plus dx. So its displacement will be a little bit different than in this displacement, we'll just naturally call that d c. Uh, the important thing here, if an element of mass in a, in a bar just translates, right? Same displacement for each end, what's happened there? Essentially nothing. There's no compression, no expansion, right? What's important here is when this displacement is not equal to that displacement. And that's going to give us the change in length of the element. So you can see the way I've drawn it here, the element has ex increased, right? You can see that its distance here, its instantaneous length here is greater than the equilibrium length. We get that by just taking this minus that, which gives us d c. So the change in length, and you can see it on the diagram here, the change in length is d c. Um, now, I didn't comment on it here, but what's going to be important is the change in this length relative to the initial length. Right? So if you imagine we have these little markers here in a rod and this thing uniformly expands. Right? There's this, the distance here has expanded, right? By a certain amount. If I, if I skip a finger and I, go and I look at this, if I double the original length, how much has that distance expanded? By twice the twice amount. Can you see it there? This uniform expansion? So what's really relevant here is when you compress a solid or expand a solid, what's really relevant here is not just this distance. It's this distance, the change in distance compared to the original distance. Because the same kind of strain, we'll define strain in a minute, but that's where we're headed here. I'm straining this material here. What's important is the change in length divided by the original length. So we define that, that's the strain. So this is a big <coughs> thing, and this is fun. You, some of you must have heard this. This is, you know, plays a, a central role in the theory of elasticity. This is how we describe what's happening to the material here, is the strain. And you can see here, it's, the ch it's defined to be the change in length 
divided by the original length. And let me say this again, because I don't know if I said it well enough. If we imagine doubling this length here, okay, and we double the D C, we double it, it's going to feel the same strain. There's the same <coughs> change in distance per unit length. You know, there's the same straining. We're doing the same, uh, we're altering material in the same way. So that's the strain, and because we have to use partials, because you remember this is a function of space and time. <coughs> so this is the definition of the strain. It's the change in length of an element divided by the equi its equilibrium length. And you'll notice it's dimensionless. Okay? That's, that's, what, that's the relevant thing here. Um, Incidentally, does, do, Pete, do you guys know what in, in uh, like a, a loop, like in this rod, what typical, how much straining there typically is? What is this value typically? Anybody know? Anybody want to guess? Well, people usually call it micro straining. They say this is micro straining. It's a millionth. What material is it? It's aluminum, right? Yeah, and it's not going to make that much. You know, I mean, we're just talking ballpark here. So, typical solids undergo micro straining. Now you can do more, okay, and if you do it enough you'll fracture the material, right? But uh, we'll, we'll talk quantitatively about this. But as long as the straining is not too big, this is, there's going to be a Hooke's Law here. Similar to, um, you know, it's going to be linear, similar to a string. Okay, so that's, we measure the deformation of a solid by the strain, d cos e dx, okay? What about uh, forcing? I should have, uh, please think of that this should be forces. Forces arise when this, this whole sentence here, you might want to just cross off and say, it's better probably to say forces cause straining. I got to exert a force to cause a strain, to change it from equilibrium. So this little f here, this, this you might want to write in, these are forces here. We look at our element, and there's going, in general, there's going to be a force from the left part of the bar on our element, and there'll be a force to, on the right part here on our element. Okay, this force f here will, can be a function of space and time, of course. And by convention, and this is the natural thing to do here, um, by convention, F is the force, at a, the force at a point here is the force of the left side on the right side. Right? You gotta, we have to specify that, otherwise we can get screwed up with signs here. So by convention, this F here is the force of the left, left to the left of the point, the force at a point is the force on of the left part of the bar on the right part of the bar. And if it's positive, it's in the right direction. It's in, to the right, okay? So that's gonna tend to cause a compression. This force is going to cause a compression of the material. If F is negative, it's going to cause an extension of the material, okay? And now we define the strain now we've got to define the other central quantity here is the stress. It's a measure of the force. And what's appropriate here is not, you might think, well, let's just deal with the force. We've got the force. Now we're going to see, and I'll point it out to you, that what's important is the force divided by the area. We're going to use the cross-sectional area here, call it capital, this is a capital S. Okay, it's not a small s, a small s is reserved for a spring constant, right? So it's an entirely different quantity than little s, all right? Make sure you see that. So the stress is defined to be the force per unit area. So what are the units here? Same units as pressure, force per unit area. So it's gonna be in Pascal for the SI unit. Okay, so a, um, a stress causes a strain. <coughs> and if I double the stress, what's gonna to happen to the strain? What do you think? Doubles. Gonna double, as long as we don't stress it too much, right? As long as we don't ex exceed the elastic limit of the material or fracture the material. So there's a local Hooke's <coughs> Law 
there's a kind of local Hooke's law applying all at you know every little small region here. You go in and you look at the strain, you look at the stress. They're going to be proportional. So by definition, the stress divided by the strain is the elastic modulus. We have to put a minus sign here. I'll explain that in a minute. But this is what um, this is the central part of the theory of elasticity. Elasticity. It's linking the stress and the strain. And usually we think of the stress as the cause and the strain as the effect. It's like a spring. You know, it's like Hooke's law, which we, we denote like this, right? So um, we think of a force as causing a, a, causing a displacement here. And as long as we're in the linear regime, as long as these the forces aren't too big, they're going to be proportional. So the, stre the proportionality of the stress and the strain is the, you know, the, the Hooke's law for elasticity. And it's going to, you know, it's clearly not going to be true for any stress, right? So, um, but there's typically a big regime in which the proportionality holds. This constant here will depend upon the material, clearly. Like, this is aluminum, right, as somebody asked. <laughs> and it's going to be different for steel, right? It's going to be greater. The elastic modulus is not, but not, not that much greater. They're, they're typically all in the same rough ballpark. You have to go to something very different to get, to get a big, like jello. Does, is, does jello still exist? Yes. Yeah, I don't that, Not in bar form. <laughs> uh, so what form? Powdered jello packets, when you make it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was making a joke. Like I was saying, you know, I can find jello. Like. No, jello <laughs> is a. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, jello is a solid, right? But it's very compliant, right? So it's going to have an elastic modulus. It's going to have a Young's modulus. I mean, you can probably look it up. I've never thought. Anybody look it up. See if you can find the Young's modulus of Jello, <laughs> and it's not going to be in the. It's not going to be anywhere near aluminum, is it? Okay, but that's this exception. But typical materials, it's all. It's all roughly the same. It's roughly uh, uh, ten to the. You know, this the units here. Rem remember, uh, the strain is dimensionless, and the stress has dimensions of pressure. So the units here, I, I think, are typically like it's in the back of the book. We have a lot. There's a lot of information in the back of KFCS, and you're going to be using that information more and more. I guess you haven't used it too much yet, have you? Oh yeah, that's going to change. S I guess starting in this chapter. Now that I think about it, yeah. So different materials have different Young modulus, and typically, I think it's like it's ten to the tenth. It's giga. You know, something gigapascals. It's big by, I don't know, some standards. You know, by Jello standards, it's big. <laughs> Did anybody look up Jello? No? Okay, that's okay. You know. <laughs> so Young's modulus of Jello. <laughs> All right. Uh, now, why do we have the negative sign here? Well, you can see here that. A po and uh, this should be reversed. We usually think of stress as causing strain, so I need to flip these. Uh, I need to flip these. Yeah, I think all you have to do is actually flip them. Positive, a positive stress here is going to cause what kind of strain? It's going to cause compression, which is negative. Compression is, is a negative strain. We just naturally do that, right? Because Here's the definition of strain. It's this change in length divided by the equilibrium. So compression, this is negative. The change is negative. So it's just not a big deal, but we need to put a minus sign here because these things have opposite sign. Uh, OK. And as I said before, you can look this up, like it is being done right now, <laughs> for different materials. And uh, remember now, this Young's the Young's modulus applies. Uh, Young's modulus is most people think of it as a static thing. You know, you 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 exert a constant force. It's infinite wavelength, and when you do that, this is going to bulge, right? So that the and and if you stretch it, it's going to contract. 
So that's the situation we have here when the wavelength is much bigger than the diameter. Now our case is, is dynamic, and you might wonder, and I shouldn't be talking about this, you might wonder if that causes any change, but uh, my experience at least is that typically it, it, it doesn't. But I'm sure there are situations where you have to be careful where, um, because the Young's modulus, mostly, most people think of it, and the way they determine it for different materials is a, usually statically or quasi-statically. So when we go to high frequency, things could be a little different, but typically they're not. Uh, okay. Yeah, this got clipped. Okay, so, um, so it's not in there. Nobody's, I can't believe you can't find the Young's modulus of Jello. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not finding I'm, it. That's disappointing. I'm disappointed in the internet. They have, a, they have it for gelatin. For modulus of gelatin gels. Oh, that's that, that's going to be yeah. typical, right? Uh, Hypergels is within the 10 to the 10 to 10 to 2 kilopascal range. So it's a pretty big range. Five Pascal. Yeah, kind of five Pascal. So it can go. Oh, so, so, yeah. So, but but steel and you know and aluminum like they're they're like I think tens of gigapascals. I think it's ten to the tens. So there's a pretty big difference there. Okay, thank you. All right. Well, we're setting things up here. Let's get. We, we remember. Getting kind of off track here. We want to. We want to try to. We want to find the wave equation which we're going to get from Newton's second law, as I mentioned. So um, we can, with our essentially Hooke's law here, we can multiply through this, bring the strain over here, okay? And we can write the stress is the strain times the elastic modulus. And when we do that, we get this, and I'm taking, I'm taking the S and putting, it's natural to put it over here, the cross-sectional area. So I put a box around this, this, is an, um, this is, tells us what the, the stress is. And this is the stress-strain relationship. Given a strain, this is telling you what kind, of force, what kind of force you have to have to do it. Or if you have that kind of force, what kind of strain you're gonna get. Does this look familiar? Yeah, it looks familiar. Think of a string, right? dy, dx, and what sits here for a string? The tension. So the Young's, the, what's playing the role of the tension here is the Young's modulus, which is a per unit area thing. Time, you know, this, is, this plays the role, the Young's modulus times the cross-sectional area is the effective tension here. And it's even analogous down to the minus sign. Remember we have a minus sign here when we're talking about the force of a string, the left part of a string acting on a yeah, so there's a, there's a really good analogy here. And we can use that. You know, that helps because we've been through a lot with strings. Uh, this says analogous to string down here. Incidentally, it's got clipped, sorry. So that's good. We have a very similar formula for the two. Okay, so now we're ready. Now we're ready. What we're going to do here is focus our attention on an element of mass. This is a, a little tiny distance here. And it's got to be true that the net force on the mass is the mass times the acceleration. That's Newton's second law, and that's going to lead to the wave equation. Now, there's one little other thing we have to be careful about here. We've talked, I've focused on this left side here. This is F. This is the force as a function of x and t. The net force, there's going to be a force of the right side of the bar on this point. So that we get by, first of all, we've got to put a minus sign here, because remember, F is the left on the right. So if I didn't have this here, this would be the force at this location and time, but it would be the right acting on the left. So I've got to put a minus sign here, because we care about, we don't care about the force of this on that, we care about the force of that on this side on this side. So the net force is the sum of these two. And what do we do next? Anybody? This is, how do we relate this to this? This Taylor expansion. Right, we're gonna take, we're just gonna use the first order Taylor expansion. So that's here. Okay, so we're gonna take that force. This is, I've, I've left the minus sign off right now. This is the magnet, 
just the force, expanded in a Taylor expansion. And this is going to be perfectly accurate because we're going to take, the, this dx means, as I said before, we're going to take the limit as it goes to zero. So we don't have to worry about the higher order terms. Okay, if you imagine this to be a delta x, this will be a, just an approximation. But in the limit as delta x goes to zero, which is what we mean by this differential here, these other terms, because they involve squares, cubes, cortexes, is not going to contribute. So the net force is the force from the left on the element, the force on the right on the element with the minus sign here, and you can see that the zero order terms cancel. Only the first order term is going to survive here. So this is making the, mathematically stating the obvious fact that the net force is the difference of these two forces. You know, if, they, if they're both the same, you're not going to get any force. So what's important is how this F changes as you move along the bar here. If it happens to be uniform, there's not going to be any force. Two forces like this of the same magnitude are net force of zero. So it makes complete sense. We know what F is down here. We can just substitute this expression <coughs> into the force here. We take the x derivative, so we get two x derivatives on C on the displacement. This is the force on the element. The mass of the element is the density times the cross-sectional area, is the density times the volume. Okay, make a note, this is the mass per unit volume, not the mass per unit length anymore, right? This is why KFCS denoted rho sub L for a string. From uh, here on out, you know, uh, it's not necessarily true. Um, we might, sometimes it's convenient to still do deal with a mass per unit length. But, so let me just say this, when you see this, this is, when you see no sub L here, this means the usual density, the mass per unit that you're all familiar with, the mass per unit volume. I need to multiply by the volume of our little plug, so it's the cross-section area times the length. And then I'm going to set the force equal to the mass times the acceleration. Here's the force, right here. Here's the mass, and there's the acceleration, just two time derivatives on the displacement. And now you can cancel the dx's Okay, and you know, really, what we're, in a more rigorous way, what we're really doing here is, you know, we're, this is a delta x, delta x, and this is an approximation. But as we take the limit as it goes to zero, it becomes exact. That's really what's that's embodied in here, okay? So it sounds, yeah. Okay, so those are gone, and now, we lump all of our parameters together into one parameter that sits downstairs here, and we call it c squared. Why do we do that? Because we've got the wave equation, and we know, you can see the wave equation here. We know that when you have two spatial derivatives minus two time derivatives on a deformation variable, you know, a displacement variable here, we know that this, you make the coefficient one here, and you, move everything upstairs, downstairs here, we know that that's the square of the speed of waves. From our, that's one of the reasons we did strings. So we can identify the wave speed here. We say, oh, we've got the wave equation, we can identify the wave speed, and you can see from here that we get that. And now, does that look familiar? What's the waves on a speed waves, speed of the, the what's the speed of waves on a string? Tension. Tension divided by the linear density, right? Well, now we have the Young's modulus, which plays the role of the tension, right? The bigger the Young's modulus is, the stiffer the material is. You know, these are different. In a string, you've got to put it under tension. In a rod, it, it, the tension occurs because you're, you're, dis, you're, you're straining it. So they're physically different situations, but the mathematics is really close here. And you may wonder, you know, we know that tension over linear density has the right units. We know this from our from strings. We know that this, I don't know, if I'm not, I can't use an equal sign here. Um, we know that this has to be, that, this, that if I take the square root of this, right, I've got to get units of velocity. Now what we have is, we have something, it doesn't have the units of linear, it just, there's a there's di dimension change here. This is mass per unit volume. Right, this is mass per unit, but remember this is not, this is essentially ten, uh, force per unit area. 
So the, the dimensions are going to work out here. It's going to work out. We're still going to get as it must, or we would have made a mistake. But the dimensions work out here. I just want to point that out because eventually you're going to wonder about that. <laughs> it, happens, it just naturally happens. But everything's fine here. The dimensions work out. And we have this good analogy here. So um, we can carry over all of our work on strings. We can carry it over to the longitudinal vibrations of a bar. We have a nice, a very nice analogy here. And again, let me remind you, there are, there are some differences, right? This doesn't have the units of tension, and this doesn't have the units of mass per unit length. But we have this strong analogy. We have to be careful here. Okay, any questions so far? So next, what we want to look at are simple boundary conditions. And we will eventually make, you know, we can put all, hang all kinds of things here. Just like we did with strings. We can have stiffnesses, we can have dash pots, you know, we can have inertia, we can add, add masses here. But let's look at the, as we did with strings, let's look at the simple ones first. Yeah. We oriented differently though, right? Yeah, yeah, and I'm, I'm going to make a point of that. Yeah, but let, let me remind you that strings are transverse oscillations. We, we're dealing with longitudinal here. And that can cause a little bit of trouble, and we're, we're going we're to talk about it with the graphs here. But that's exactly, you're exactly right. Okay, so um, how do we handle fixed, fixed boundary conditions? We're going to have normal modes, which we just call standing waves, right? And how do we get them? How do we describe this mathematically? Well, we have the wave equation. We know that this is the general solution to the wave equation. It's an arbitrary right traveling wave, arbitrarily left tra traveling wave here. We impose the boundary condition. We've been through this many times, but we'll do it one more. We impose the f a fixed boundary. Oh, I have to say something here. <laughs> if, so we've got like an aluminum rod between two walls here, right? So suppose you were doing this in an experiment and you want these ri be rigid walls. You don't want that link to change. Do you think you're going to have trouble with that? Oh yeah, believe me. And I know I speak from experience, not from uh, metal, but from water, which is not as stiff as aluminum or steel. But we were, do we were doing an experiment once where we, we wanted to have you know, we were dealing with sound and water, and we wanted fixed boundary conditions. And it was, we never did make it there. We ended up using a brass resonator with one inch thick walls. Okay, it was heavy. And uh, probably expensive to make too, I can't remember. So we had this water in a cylinder, and we wanted fixed bound for our purposes. I'm not, not going to tell you what that was, what, what that was, because you know, I could just go on forever on that, right? So it was for this partic particular research experiment. And we just, uh, it, uh, we stopped with a one inch, it wasn't very satisfactory, it wasn't very rigid. Water is pretty stiff. It's not, you know, it's not up to where aluminum is, but once you get to these stiff materials, this is just really not practical. This is just theoretical. We'll talk about the, the more, much more practical cases, free, free. We'll talk about that next. So anyway, but for fixed fix, we go through just what we went through for strings. And at this point, many of you, maybe not all of you, but I think many of you, you can skip all this. You can just go directly from here. And the better way of writing this is that when we impose the boundary condition on the left here, we know that our displacement here is going to have to be proportional. We know, we know, we know we're looking for standing waves. We know we have to have a zero at x equals zero. And we know we have to have separation of space and time. It's a standing wave. So we can immediately write this down, where omega, there has to be a relationship. To satisfy the wave equation, we have to have omega is equal to ck. So the sooner you get, as I mentioned to you before, the sooner you get down to write, just writing this without going through, then there's different ways you can do it here, the better. So I'm, as I've been encouraging you, you I'm, I'm sure you remember, to, to just write this down. It saves time and trouble. But if, if you don't 
feel comfortable with it, you can do this, right? And you can come up with this. This is irrelevant here. This, this is just all a constant here. The important thing is this proportionality. And you can see that x is equal to zero. We get zero as we must because we have a fixed boundary condition. And we have a solution to the wave equation and it's a standing wave. The next step, the final step, is to impose this boundary condition. We want no displacement at x equals L. And this is where we discretize. This has a continuum values of, uh, continuum of solutions here. Omega and k can be anything as long as they obey this relationship. But to meet this boundary condition it will now be only true for a discrete set of values. And we have to have the sign of KL equals zero, and that means that KL has to be n pi. So we label each of these k's by this integer n. We can solve, we've been through this before, I'm just reminding you. Here's the wavelength, remember? K is two pi over the wavelength. Uh, and I'll show you a diagram of that in a moment, but usually we go right for the frequency, the frequency spectrum. Once we know the wavelength, we just take C over the wavelength to get the frequency, and here we get this nice frequency spectrum. They're all integer multiples of the fundamental. They are harmonics. The fundamental has frequency C over 2L. What does it look like? Does this look familiar? Of course, right? But, but there's been a change, right? In the string, this is what you would actually see for the fundamental fixed fixed string. You would actually see this. And this would be the next mode up, okay? Um, in the bar, you don't see this. The bar, this is the displacement this way but being plotted on an XY plot. Right, so what's actually happening is it's moving. This corresponds to motion, you know, displacement this way. So when we're up here, let's say this is a turning point. In this situation, the bar is strained. It's the, all the mass except right at the ends has moved over there, and it's momentarily at rest. Okay, and it's uh, so it's all potential energy, <laughs> and then it's going to come back and go through the origin at some time, then all the energy will be kinetic, and then it's going to go all the way over symmetrically on the other side here. So it's harder to see this, but the way we represent it is, of course, graphically we represent it this way. The difference between a, the rod and the string is that this is what you actually see for the string, but you don't see that for the rod. So you have to use your imagination. Right? The modes here are just the, as I mentioned, they're harmonic. You can see we have half a wavelength, two halves. This is going to be twice the frequency. This will be three times the frequency, and it's etc. And as we go up, here's a node. Here's a displacement node. So here the bar is is doing. Uh, you know, this is the bar. It's doing. Well, like I diagrammed it here. That's what that's what it's doing here. So you can see we have a positive hump here. That represents a displacement to the right there. And then it's negative over here, so the displacement's this way. So it, it works. It works. It's right. <laughs> and you can just keep going forever. So here are our, these are the standing wave modes of a, a fixed, fixed bar, a rod. We know that the general, these are norm, the normal modes. So the general solution is a superposition over all <coughs> modes. And I, I, I think what happened here was I had the e to the i omega t nt, but I decided it was too close to the border, so I whited it out and then waited for it to dry and forgot to go back. That's probably what happened. So you want to add, can you please add here, we need e to the i omega nt. We need to multiply. We need to multiply this. Inside the summation, it needs an e to the i omega nt. Okay? okay? So, for solids, as I told you, it's much more typical to have free boundary conditions, okay? Um, remember our, the boxed equation, important equation for the force. Remember, I've just reproduced it here. If we have a free end, that means there's no force. So this rod is vibrating and it's not pushing against anything. It can't, there's no, there can't be any force there. It's just vacuum or, or air is a good approximation in this case. 
So to have force free, we have to have no slope. Is this starting to sound familiar? Yep. And it's analogous to a free free string. So here we see, oh, you could go through, remember when I was talking about this? You can go through this again. Now you want to make it cosine of kx because you want zero slope at the origin. And then when you demand zero slope at the other end, you're going to get the spectrum. And it's the same spectrum as before. You'll notice here, I don't think I emphasize this with strings, but maybe it's time to do it. This, there's a half a wavelength here. It's going to have a certain frequency. There's one wavelength here. It's going to have a certain frequency. What do we have here for the free-free case? What is, what kind of, how much of a wavelength is that? Half a wavelength. So the frequency spectrum, the frequencies are identical. For a fixed fixed bar, or a free free bar, or a fixed fixed string and a free free string, the waveforms are, are shifted, they're spatially shifted. The frequencies are the same. And incidentally, I don't think I said this before, but this index here in is for fixed fixed and free free. It doesn't work when you mix the boundary conditions, but for fixed fixed and and free free, n is just the number of half wavelengths. n equals one, we have one half wavelength. n equals two, do we have two half wavelengths, which means one wavelength, etc. So you, that's a nice interpretation of n, but it's not true in, you know, for mixed boundary conditions. So here we have something similar to before. Now the motion would, would be looked like this. We have a node here in the center, and you have all these modes. And by the way, um, I don't know if we've, I don't think we've talked about this before, but acoustics, you know, the science of acoustics and music are inextricably entwined. It goes way back and there's no way that's ever going to change, right? So you'll, you'll see this, and I don't know if we've seen it yet, but this twice the frequency, I think I talked about this, this is an octave up. Whenever the frequency is doubled, the musical interval, going, if you could imagine hearing this, and you hear this, you would hear an octave. Okay, that's a doubling of the frequency. Um, this, what's this? Well, this is a triple, it's, it's not a doubling of this. That would be the next, would be this mode here. So the fourth mode is an octave up from the second mode. What's this? Well, it happens to be a, what's a fifth, or a perfect, what they call a fifth, or a perfect fifth. And, let's, uh, uh, Somebody get the lights, please. Thank you. Let's go back to the demo here. All right? When I excite this rod, holding it at the center, oh, I'm holding it at the center. So what modes am I going to, am I going to excite these modes? No. Even modes are not going to be excited. But what about this one? Yes. Yeah. And the nature of the drive here, it doesn't have any inherent frequency. It's this slip stick thing. So we would expect to ap appreciably excite this, okay? Now some of you can probably hear it's in there. It's, it's strong. Some of you, if you have any training, musical training, you can hear it. In fact, let me try to suppress it. Oh, that's pretty pure. Now this is tricky. Okay, it's really strong, but I wish it weren't so strong because a standard demo to do here, and this is one of the reasons we've scribed, I had the, the machinist, excuse me, model maker, scribe this here, is that to show that there are these two modes, to convince you completely, even though I think most of you probably heard that higher, higher mode bit, is I'm gonna next hold it at one sixth of the way, I'm gonna, I'm holding it right here, and now I'm going to hold it there. That's going to kill this mode, and you will hear what's left. <laughs> Sorry. God, I wish I could do a, let me try to get, it's so loud that, that this harmonic here, this octave plus the fifth is very strong today. You know, it depends upon the day when you do demos. No one can explain that. <coughs> and the room. Move a demo to another room. Or the big joke is moving a demo from the demo lab to a classroom can be, can be completely different. <laughs> yeah, I wish somebody would figure out what's going on there. 
It's still pretty strong. Yeah, I just can't. Oh, yeah, it's where I do. Yeah. Still pretty strong, isn't it? But it's like, that was a little better. And you can even go to the next one will be. Why are you having to release it? Shouldn't there be a node in the middle still? Oh, that's a good point. I don't have to do that. It's a lot easier. Thank you. Yeah. It's just that people in the past have always done this, so I just went along, you know? <laughs> yeah, I was left better. Yeah, so it can be subtle. And people with trained ears, they, you know, they can, they can hear it even when, it's, when we can't hear it, you know, they can, they can hear it. Maybe you know people like that. In fact, um, okay, well, well, we'll pick up here tomorrow. Okay, this is the mixed case. But there's an, I want to tell you guys an old saying. I don't think I've told you this before. I learned this from an acoustician, a guy in graduate school. He's now semi-retired from Penn, Penn State. They do a lot of acoustics at Penn State. I think I may have, you guys know that? You should, you should be aware of that. Uh, he used to say that acousticians are just failed musicians. <laughs> it's a lot, and there's a lot of truth in that. There's a lot of truth to that. So there is this big, there is this big connection. We're going to see more and more of it as we as we go along. Okay. Any quick questions or comments?